Last week, uh, Courtney called me and she told me that somebody had hit our van with uh, a door. I suppose somebody accidentally opened up their door, hit our van, and it was just this little nick in the handle. And this morning, considering what we're going to be looking at, basically all that we can do this morning is make a very little attempt at this truth. We are going to be looking at the fact and great truth that God is holy this morning, that He is holy. And we are going to begin in Exodus chapter 20. And I think it is right for us, when we're thinking about the holiness of God, and we're thinking about our God who is thrice holy, 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 that we think of God's holiness like this, at least in one sense. It is because of everything that God is that He's holy. When you think of the love of God, the wrath of God, the majesty of God, when you think of the zeal of God, when you think of the fact that God does not change, when you think of all these great truths, the mercy and faithfulness, the patience of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the wisdom of God, and everything else, when you think of all these things, those things make Him holy, if we want to say it that way. He is holy. I want us to see what I mean here. Here's The first thing I want us to see, and obviously it's logically where you have to begin if we're going to talk about the holiness of God, is that we have to define what that word means, don't we? Uh, one of the mistakes that most people make when they think of the holiness of God is they instantly think of He's sinless, He's righteous. All those things are true and they're contained in the word holy, certainly. But holiness means something different than that. Uh, those things are contained. But holiness does not mean He is sinless. He is sinless. There's something far different, though, than that. So we're going to begin here in Exodus chapter 20 this morning. And we're going to start with the fourth commandment. And from the fourth commandment, we're going to get an idea of what it means to be holy today. Let's start reading in verse 8. Verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now look back in verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Now the first part of verse 10. But the seventh day. Now what does it mean to be holy? The word holy means to be separate, to be different. So what you see here is you've got six normal days. This is what God's law said to the Israelites in the book of Exodus. You have six normal days. But then there's another day that's set apart. It's special. It's different. That's what holiness means. It's something that is separated from regular things. If you look over in chapter 26 of Exodus, look in verse 31 to 33. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. You shall hang it on four pillars of a kao overlaid with gold, their hooks also being of gold on four sockets of silver. You shall hang up the veil under the clasps and and shall bring in the ark of the testimony there within the veil. And the veil shall serve for you as a partition between the holy place and the holy of holies. Again, what does it mean to be holy? Well, you've got the tabernacle and you have two main, you have two sections. You have the first section, which is holy, yes. Then you have that most holy place that only the high priest could go in 
to one day out of the year. And what do you have? You have a veil there separating it. You have the cherubim on the veil, the cherubim that guard the presence of God, that mark off His presence. And what is that? That room is holy. Very, very holy. And what does that mean? It's separate. It's different. It's not for common use. There's something special about that room. So when we talk about the holiness of God this morning, when you read about God being holy, and He's always been holy, you're reading what that means is not that He's sinless in the first place, not that He's righteous in the first place, but you are reading about the fact that God is different than anything in the world. Um, I've heard something like this said, and though we might want to qualify it some, it's still true. Someone asked the question like this, what is more like God, an archangel or one of these animals you see out running in the woods? What's more like God? And the answer is neither, because nothing's like God. They're all creation. God is the creator. There's nothing like God. So when we talk about our God, the only God being holy, what we're saying is He is separate. He is different than everything else. And even as us, if you're a Christian this morning, here's the amazing thing, you're called a saint. And the word saint means holy one. So we get to partake in His holiness, and yet at the same time, only God is holy. So that's the first thing we see here. Now let's look now at what it really, some of the great truths of what it means for God to be holy. Let's start in Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57, let's start in this truth. Listen to what it says in the first part of verse 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. When you're thinking about God, you're thinking about the one whose name, whose very name is holy. And when we, when we speak of someone's name, we're talking about everything about him. When you talk about someone's name in the Bible's times, it's speaking about everything. To say that God's name is holy is to say that every single thing about God is holy. Do you know what that means? That means that God's love is holy. You know what you hear sometimes? You hear people say, you know what, God could have had justice with you, but He had love instead. And is, does that mean that His love is not just? You say, I see what they're saying, and there's truth in what somebody's saying like that. But even when God shows love, He cannot hold back His holiness. No, His love is with the holiness. That's why Christ had to die for us. Even His mercy and forgiveness shows His holiness. Because the only way that we as sinners can partake of that forgiveness is that the holy God has offered up a holy sacrifice for us. His name is holy. I want you to listen to Exodus chapter 3 this morning. Exodus chapter 3. As others have pointed out, I want you to look in verse 14. We, we see a glimpse again of what it means for God to be holy. An expression of His holiness, we may say. This, of course, is the famous passage. You have Moses. You have the burning bush. Moses, God has, has told Moses to take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Well, listen to what God says to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. What does it mean when God says, I am who I am? God is saying to Moses, I am the self-existent one. Each and every one of us here have our lives and our being because of God. God had made us live. God gave us life. And one day, each and every one of us will lose that breath. And God will take our spirits. And if we're saved, we'll go with Him. If we're lost, we'll be separated from Him. Again, the big difference between God and us is that no one created God. In His own being, He exists. He is who He is. I am who I am. He is self-existent. Therefore, Him being self-existent means He exists out of His own will, we may say. He never had a beginning. He's holy. He's separated from. He's different than we are in that regard. I want you to listen to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. 
This is the famous vision of Isaiah. I've touched on this already, but some people think of holiness as sinlessness. What you see in this passage is you have Isaiah. He's got a vision of heavenly beings. And they are sinless heavenly beings. And I want you to listen to how they're described, starting in verse 2. Seraphim stood above him. Stood above God. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face. Here are these sinless beings, and what do they do? They have six wings. They only use two to fly with, though. With two of their wings, they will cover their face so they cannot even look upon the holiness of God. These are sinless beings. They cannot even look upon God, is the picture we're getting. Each having six wings, with two he covered his faith, face, and with two he covered his feet. Though they are sinless, they are not worthy to live, to walk in God's presence. They will cover their feet up. They will cover their face up. They are not worthy to be around God. And with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now we believe in the love of God, don't we? But this is important. God is always loving. And yet the Bible never says that God is love, love, love. It only says that He is holy, holy, holy. That is saying, that's emphasizing for us the character of God. I want you to listen to Job 15. Job chapter 15. This is being spoken of from one of Job's friends. Job's friends oftentimes had right theology and applied it wrongly. And here we get a glimpse, I believe, of again right theology, but we're going to apply it rightly this morning. Job 15, verse 15 through 16. Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones. And the heavens are not pure in his sight. What's he saying there? The heavens, there's no, there's no sin in heaven, obviously. What is Job's friend saying? Job's friend is saying, even that which has no sin is not holy enough for God. He's so separated. Verse 16, much, how much less one who is detestable and corrupt, man who drinks iniquity like water. We'll look at at least three more places right now. Habakkuk, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 13. We now, we begin to see now, we're seeing some of the, the, how God's holiness is played out, if we want to say it that way. We're seeing examples of His holiness. But now we're going to begin to see how God views humanity in His holiness. Verse 13 in Habakkuk, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. The Bible says of God, you cannot look on wickedness with favor. You cannot give approval to sin. That's how holy He is. The psalmist in Psalm 5, the psalmist says this in verse number 4, 5, and 6. Psalm 5, verse 4, 5, and 6. Now, we may talk about these for a little while because these these verses are so needed today. They're so neglected. Uh, we, We hear much about God's love and we ought to hear much about God's love. We're so thankful for His love. And yet, these verses tell us another side of who God is. It's still good. It's holy. It's right. But listen to what is said here. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Now, have you ever thought about that before? When you're reading the Psalms, have you ever thought about a verse like that? Uh, We know that God loves sinners. We rejoice in that. 
And yet the Bible very plainly says to us here that in, because of God's holiness and His righteousness, He actually says, for, He says, you hate all who do iniquity. You know, you've heard the phrase, I'm sure God loves the sinner and hates the sin. Well, there's truth in that. He certainly does love the sinner and hates the sin. But we really need to reevaluate statements like that, don't we? That's very true. And yet this is true as well because of God's holiness. It is not sin that He will punish for eternity. He will punish sinners for eternity. And for those here who, who, are, who aren't converted, who haven't come to God, who haven't been saved, you need to think about the fact, yes, God does love you. His Spirit does woo you to, the, to, the, to Christ to be saved. But at the same time, there's abhorring of sinners and sin. Verse 6, You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit, the Bible says. Now these aren't my words. These are God's words. If We have to have room in our theology. We have to have room in our thinking. For these verses, these are very much part of the Bible. And these show forth the holiness of God and the fact that He has separated Himself from sinners. What separates us from God? Your sins have separated you from God, the Bible says. We see that here. Look in Psalm 7, starting in verse 11. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. How can, not, how can God be righteous and good and not have indignation every day is what I want to know. You watch the news, you listen to the news, you see what's happening in our country, you have indignation. Well, how much more does God have the right to be angry at sinners and at sin? And even more so than this world, we speak a lot about the country and we ought to. The church has a message for the country. The church has a message for sinners outside of the church. We ought to speak about these things. But the reality is this, the, the greatest disgust in front of God are churches that claim to be churches that speak wrong of God and who He is and of the Gospel. Verse 12 and 13, if a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. That's God. That's who God is. You see, when you begin to describe to somebody who God really is, that's when you may begin to see them get very angry. Uh, if, if all we ever do is go to somebody and knock on their door and we tell them how nice they are and how, how good God is and the plan that God has for their life and how wonderful... When, when we talk about that, that's why so many churches are filled right now. We have a lot of people who, who, have, who have confessed the Lord. They think they're saved. They've never looked upon what the Bible actually says in a full totality, the full view of God. He is holy. He is holy. He is separated from sinners. Now, Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at our response to God's holiness. As you're turning there, let me give you another expression of the holiness of God. And this is the greatest expression of God's holiness. is the cross of Jesus Christ. On the cross, what you have... You have so many things going on when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. But what you have happening on the cross is God saying to humanity, I am so holy that I cannot just simply forgive your sin. Your sin must be punished. God is so holy. He is so righteous. He is sinless. He is the judge of all the earth. He cannot overlook sin. And in His holiness, He says to us on the cross, that I am so holy, the only way that you can be forgiven is if my Son dies for you. That's what God says to us. And Jesus willingly died for us. And yet in God's holiness, when He says about the cross that my, your sin is so bad, my Son must die for you, at the same time God says, I am so holy and so distinct and so different than you are, I can love you still. 
And the cross shows His love for us as well. It's the greatest demonstration of the holiness of God. You have the wrath of God being poured out upon God's dear Son. Why is it poured out? Because God hates sin. He abhors sin and sinners. And yet on this other side, you have the greatest demonstration of the holiness of God. What is that demonstration? It is God saying, I love sinners so much, I want to give My Son to rescue them from judgment and from hell. It is the greatest demonstration that God is different than we are. And when you think about the holiness of God, you think about how great He is, you think about what He's done, what He hasn't done, you think about how separate He is from sinners, we have to ask, what's our response now? What's our response to the holiness of God? Well, look here in Matthew 5. We'll look at a few verses starting in verse 3. And, um, and these verses are speaking of Christians, but certainly they instruct us in what we must do as well to be Christians. Our response to God's holiness, look in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What is the response that we have to have to God's holiness? First of all, we have to have humility, don't we? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? If I pulled my wallet out right now and I said, I'm poor, I'm poor in my wallet, that means I'm poor in money. And when I say to God, I'm poor in spirit, what I'm saying is, I have nothing to boast about. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I have nothing. I'm humbled before you. That's our response to God. Look in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn. What is our response to God's holiness and God's Word revealed to us when we see who He is? Our response to God is mourning. I mourn over my sin. I'm sorry for the things that I've done to God. Verse 5, blessed are the gentle. When I see how holy and good God is to me, I'm going to treat people with gentleness and love. Because God has done that. And I'm just a sinner before I'm converted. And then in verse 6, our response to God must be, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The response to God is, I want more of you, Lord. This is after we're converted. I want more of God. Uh, you know, if we're here today and, 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 and we don't have a, a, a true hunger and desire to know God more, that is, that is, that's either a sign that we have, we have backslidden and we are in grave danger, or that's a sign we've not come to know Him yet. Uh, the fact that we're alive physically is we keep craving food, right? You stop craving food, you're either really sick or you're dead. And the fact for us as Christians, the fact that God is so great, what that means is we, we can continually get as much as we want from God to know His knowledge. And what happens? There's more left to know about God. There's more. There's more. We hunger. We thirst after righteousness. We look at the world in which we live. We see the chaos happening. What happens? We hunger and thirst for things to be made right in this world. That's our response. God is holy. Therefore, His people must be holy. Therefore, we must desire holiness in every area of life. Psalm 5. We turn back to Psalm 5. Psalm 5 is from where some of those fearful yet true verses came from, but this verse comes from Psalm 5 as well. What is the response to the holiness of God? Verse 11, But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And may you shelter them that those who love your name may exult in you. I hope that you can testify to this. And I know many of you can. But once you see God's holiness, you're looking for a place to hide, aren't you? Once you see... I remember when I was a kid, I would, I would, you know, I would, I would go to Sunday school. I never wanted to go to Sunday school. And I remember telling my teacher, I've told you this before, I remember telling my teacher in Sunday school, we were talking about sin. I said, yeah, I sin all the time. It's not a big deal, though. I said that out loud in the class. I was like 19 years old in my Sunday school class. And I told my godly teacher in front of everyone, yeah, I sin, but it's not that big of a deal. 
And I say this not at all about me. It most certainly isn't about me. But once God revealed something of Himself to me, that attitude changed quite quickly. When you begin to see who God is, and you begin to see His holiness, you're looking for a place to hide, or you're looking for a refuge to run to and grab hold of. And here what we see today is so often in churches, people, we, we, we preach, we teach, other people teach, they preach, and everybody leaves, and, and there's no fear. There's no fear of God, and, and they're having dances and doing all this nonsense at churches, and they're, they're having all this stuff going on, and there's literally smoke and lights going on, and they're just having a party. They're literally having a beach ball, hitting it up, and telling you, once you see the holiness of God, you stop those things. And once somebody begins to see the holiness of God, and as a consequence of seeing the holiness of God, they see that they're not holy, when they begin to see themselves like that, friends, they're looking for a way to become holy like Him. Amen? We, we, we see something. And I'm not saying you have to have this experience to be a Christian. It's very dangerous. You may be here and you came and God was very gentle. You knew you were a sinner, but God gently led you to Christ. You're just as saved as somebody who came to God under the thunders of the law. Okay? It doesn't, it's not so much how we come to God. It's just a matter of the fact that we actually do get there and we're saved and we've repented and we've believed. That's what matters. But listen, there's, an ex- there's experiences, and maybe some of you know something about this. You get a vision, and I'm not saying you necessarily have a real vision, but God has a vision to your heart of who He is, and you don't want to go to sleep at night. Because what if you wake up in hell? You're doubting your salvation, and God is dealing with you about something, and, 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 and you're afraid to go to bed and to sleep. Why? Because what happens if your eyes open and you're in a pit and it's too late? John Engel James, the great preacher and, 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 and physician of the soul, he talked about, oh, how awful it is to make an error in the high things of religion. Why is it so bad, preacher? It's so bad because if we make a serious error in religion and we die that way, he said you'll have all of eternity to regret it and not one moment to change it. It's too late, he says. I just hope that we have had this vision in our heart of who God is and who we are. Um... One of the great revivals on the island of Lewis, I believe it's pronounced, Duncan Campbell. Anybody ever heard of Duncan Campbell? Powerful man of God. This a revival. And on the island of Lewis, I believe it's back in the 1950s perhaps, this revival happened. The revival broke out. And what you have is this, is this wife, this Christian wife, and I don't know, if, I think maybe the preacher comes to see her. And she goes down to the cellar and she opens up the cellar door and there's her husband at the, in the cellar under the ground like this, crying out for God for mercy. And she, say, and she says, there's the great sinner. That's what happens when God shows us our sin. So when we think about the holiness of God, it's not only that He is holy, He is separate. It's that He's separated from us. And if He's separated from us, that must mean that we are not holy. And we have to have something happen to us. Something has to change within us. I want you to look at Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. And here's the promise of God. The promise of God for us. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, do you know what you need to do to become a Christian? It's not to become holy. Because you cannot be holy. You're not a Christian. You have to come to Him first. It's like like you're sick and somebody says, what do you have to do to go to the doctor? Well, you got to get well first. No. 
You go to the doctor to get well. If you're not a Christian this morning, what you have to do is, is humble yourself before God, ask Him to forgive you, to repent, to turn away from sin, and to believe in Jesus. And you can do that while you're sitting in your pew listening to me preach right now. If you repent in your heart and believe in Christ, God will save you. That's a promise of God. Once someone has come to repentance and they've come to faith in Christ, they are a Christian. Now, with that said, here's the promise that I want us to see right now. What does God do to us as Christians? Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. This is a promise. What's God saying? I'm going to cleanse you, He says. Every Christian is cleansed. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. He's going to cleanse us. Our sins are cleansed. Yes, we're forgiven. But not only are you forgiven, but you've been changed. <clears throat> What's God's purpose in making us? God made Adam and Eve. They failed. God called Noah. He failed. His family failed. The descendants. God called Abraham, and from Abraham came Israel. They failed. God sent His Son and He succeeded. What's the purpose of us being here? It's to fill this earth with holy people. That's our purpose. Our purpose is to show forth the glory of God in our lives. Remember what He said? He said to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What happens in Genesis chapter 11? They say, uh-uh, we're going to build us a tower and we're going to go straight to heaven. We're not going to fill that. We're not going to make a name for God. No, no. We're making a name for ourselves. And God stops that. Our purpose here on earth is to be holy people to give God glory and to fill this beautiful world with His glory through our holy lives. And how does God do that? He comes to us and rescues us and saves us. Look in verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He says, I'm going to put my spirit within you and I'm going to take that stony heart out that was hard as a rock that would not do what I said. I'm going to take that stony heart out. I'm going to put a heart of flesh in that can feel, that's real, that's alive, and that will obey me. Verse 27, I will put My Spirit within you and cause you to walk in My statutes. When you, when, when you go out in the world and you see those who confess the name of Christ, but they throw off His commands like they're nothing. God says, I'm going to cause you to live holy lives. I will put My Spirit within you and cause you to walk in My statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. My friends. What is this saying in short? It's saying that the holy God condescends to sinful men and transforms them into holy people so He can dwell with us. We have, we have these big sections in the Old Testament about the tabernacle, about the temple. Why are they there for? I mean, can we just skip over them in our reading? Don't worry about the, don't worry about the tabernacle, the temple. We don't do those. We're being taught a lesson there. We're being taught a lesson that for God to dwell with sinful men, there must be a sacrifice. For us to come into the presence of God, something has to be done. And what does the Bible say now? It actually says that God lives inside of us. That we are the temple of God, the Bible says. And how is that possible? Because He gives us of His Holy Spirit. And that, and the Holy Spirit comes within us and changes us. It changes us. Praise the Lord for that. And may the Lord bless us this morning. 
May we always treat the Lord as holy. As they're coming to, uh, to get our closing hymn, let me say one more thing. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 6 how the Lord teaches us to pray? He says, uh, you are to pray this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we're to treat His name as holy. But here's the amazing thing. It says there, our Father. And what we have is not only is God holy and majestic and, and just separated from sinners. No, yes, that's all true, but He is our Father who draws near and loves us and cares for us. He is holy. Let's sing this morning.